just take a moment and just put your hand on your neighbor, would you? Can we just agree in faith today for those on our right and on our left that something significant, something supernatural, something could just shift and change, that we have ears to hear, hearts to receive, that His presence becomes tangible. Because in His presence, mountains melt like wax. Mm. We just believe for healing in sick bodies. Minds restored. Mm. We don't take this time for granted. And if you have just a little bit of faith, let it just soar today. Let your faith just arise today in the living God, our perfect Father, Whatever we ask in his name. So 30 seconds, what you're asked, talk to him just for a moment. Father, we're here. Mm, It's your hospital room. We're here. Move, Lord. Speak, Lord. May there be a mighty impartation from Zion. Psalms 20. What's in your hands to come to our hands? We pray that river whose streams may glad the city. Let what's done in this room spread to every zip code in this valley, Father, we pray. We thank you. This city, this region belongs to Jesus. Yes. In Jesus' name. Amen. Just want to get a good picture of you. I know I can't see you online, but we're so honored to serve you. It's our real privilege to do that. And we're waving at you. We're giving you a big virtual hug today. But I'd just like to take this moment in. Ab and I have been looking all week for this moment together. It's special, isn't it? Aren't you thankful to be part of the household of God in a big family? Isn't that a wonderful thing? To not be alone, wavering and wandering, but to be a part of a local family of God. We get together once a week, but you can really do it at your own terms. There's a lot going on here. You could actually, you could become more committed if you like. And if you like us, you could even become part of a life group or something fun like that. Wow. I'm really excited about the word today and want to teach something I really feel the Spirit of God on. I, I would say if, if you would ask me, um, and I'm not a prophet or the, the son of a prophet, I'm just, a, just one who loves Jesus. And ask him to use me as he wants to use me. But if I were to say what God is doing to his church is he's taking us to a place of a beautiful, powerful blend of spirit and truth. I think in past seasons it was one or the other. We were strong in truth and the word and beautiful teaching that kind of choked out the spirit of God. Or we got way off just spirit and no word. I think what God's doing in the church is he's reviving the wonder of the spirit and the power of the word and we are becoming spirit and truth. And it's a wonderful thing. And he's including all ages and all walks of life in where we're going. Spirit and truth. Amen. Um, as, uh, uh, as, as your pastors that we take great humility and honor in doing, but, but also just as a mom and dad, can we ask you for your favor? Can I give you a homework assignment? Our daughter, she's serving in children's right now. Her name is Hope Rose Pollock. In, in, uh, in, in my Rolodex, she's called Dove. Tomorrow she turns 17. Can you do us a favor? Can you make her feel real special and tell her happy? I know it's hard to believe she's 17. Isn't that crazy? Do you know that our youngest daughter will be driving? I took Brooke out driving this week, and so did Abby. That's scary. Look out Winchester. (laughs) But would you do us a favor? She's in the children's. Tell Hope you love her and appreciate her. Would you do that? Amen. Can you, one more time, put your hands together and thank all the helping hands that make this possible. You're amazing. We love you. So good. We're so blessed. Woo! I'm excited. Come on, let's just shout a praise unto God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I'm not going to let the rocks cry out. Too much to be thankful for. You ready for the word of the Lord? The word of the Lord and the spirit of the Lord. If you would open with me in your Bibles to Romans chapter 14 this morning. 
Romans 14. I want to speak today on, this is part five of the way of truth. And I want to subtitle today and speak today, teach today on this really important, extremely significant idea of the culture and character of truth. The culture and character of truth. Because the Bible is specific to announce to us and to teach to us what life in truth looks like. And I want to talk about the character and culture of that. You're there in Romans, but for me, I got to insert Psalms 51, verse 6, because it's very telling of the mind and wisdom of God. In Psalms 51, verse 6, it says, Behold, you desire, or your desire is, that truth be in my inward parts, found on the inside, and in the hidden part of my life. Amen? And then Romans chapter 14, beautiful portion of Scripture, highlight it, mark it. If you're looking for a devotional or something to chew on this week, spend some time in here. It's profound. And for time's sake, i got to reduce it, but, but we'll get to where we want to go. Romans 14, 14, I know and I'm convinced, convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. Yet if your brother is grieved because of your food and you are no longer walking in love, do not destroy with your food the one for whom Christ died. Therefore, do not let your good be spoken of as evil. And then verse 17, my friends, is a gold mine. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, external, where you live, how you dress. But the kingdom of God is righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. Bingo, we really are tapping into something real clear now on the culture and the nature of truth. It's not exterior, it's internal. Righteousness, peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. I would say the four governments of God in the earth right now, righteousness, peace and joy through the Holy Spirit. For he who serves Christ in these things is acceptable to God and approved by men. Therefore, let us Pursue, say pursue, these things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for a man who eats with offense or bitterness or judgment. It is good neither to eat meat nor to drink wine nor to do anything by which your brother stumbles or is offended or is made weak. Do you have faith? But he who doubts is condemned if he eats because he who does not eat from faith for whatever is not of faith is sin. I really want to establish today the culture and character of truth. Especially in this hour, especially in this generation, it's very important, and I believe from a biblical, godly perspective, that God places extreme value on character and culture. The scripture is very clear on the specifics of how God thinks and how God operates and how God does what he does. And when we get born again, we get born with a new nature that is made in the image of God that endeavors to live in and through our lives. We must understand that truth is an inside job. And truth, being an inside job, desires to establish a firm character and culture within us all. Thanks, Alec. The way, the way of truth, it's a way of life with a distinction. We're distinct. We're uncommon. And there's a culture. Let me for a moment this morning define culture. 
culture, excuse me, character is one, is the one who you truly are. It's the mental and moral qualities, the attributes that make up an individual's person. Character is the unseen, inner substance and conditions and convictions that make up one's life. Character are the qualities that govern and dictate your behavior, your attitude, and your actions. The real you is the character no one can see. Culture is another powerful reality that we're all affected by. Culture is the way or the rhythm by which you live your life. It's your pace. Typically, culture was passed down and you inherited from other generations a culture that you are passing down to other generations. Culture is that learned behavior based upon various influences of how we were raised, what we were taught, the various traumas we've been in life, that creates a culture by which character flows through. Culture is the vehicle which carries out your culture, your character. Culture is the vehicle which carries out your character. Culture is what you believe, it's your convictions. We, we must understand that in walking with God, my inward condition will always determine my outward position. The Lord loves and prizes character. And in my estimation, we don't talk about it enough, especially in spirit-filled, charismatic churches, we talk more about the exterior things than the internal things. And, and the Lord desires that there be a strong culture and character that resembles and mimics him operating in our lives. He does desire that we become Christ-like. That the nature of him is being formed in and through us and we're manifesting the nature of him in us. In Psalms 50, 23, it says, whoever offers praises glorifies me. We did that this morning, but then it says to him who orders his conduct aright, I'll show him my. A lot of us live in a place of that praise and sacrifice, but we don't take the time to get our character and conduct right in his image, which he can show us greater levels of salvation. We praise him, we shout, we do the external things, but there's something powerful when you align your conduct in accordance with the inward working of truth. And the closer you get to the Lord, the more you want to walk with him, the more your character will matter. Does he pull out a magnifying glass? Well, he does, because he talks about pure hands and clean hearts. The closer you get, the more he highlights those inner workings of your life. That's not a bad thing, it's a good thing because he loves us and chastens us and desires us to become all that he's called us to be. And I would say this, in the kingdom of God, character and culture matter most. The inward workings of God, though, take the longest. There's no shortcuts. Have you realized? Takes a long, long time to develop these attributes he's after. But let me tell you, they'll take you the furthest. And I would suggest and submit to you and to me and all of us that the sky's the limit. I mean, there's nothing God cannot do, and he desires through all of us to do great and mighty things. Didn't Daniel 11.32 say he's called you to do great exploits? Come on, that should make you shout. You're called to do great, great exploits in his name. 
all throughout the word. Jesus said, you do works and even greater works you shall do. And we love that and we shout at that. But there's a caveat. God can only take you as far as your character can sustain you. From the pulpit to the pew. From the coworker to the employee or to the employer, your character and culture will either propel you or hinder you in what God wants to do through you. Take a praise break and thank the Lord for his word. Amen. Because Dick and Jan, you're 56 years married, you're still shining and bright. And your great blessing to this church. 57 years, I apologize. How could I? I'm so sorry. From the seniors to the youngest, God is at work in our lives, working in us and through us to accomplish his will. So we love the gifting of God. I mean, desire to prophesy. We want to lay hands on. We love the manifestations of the Spirit of God. We love his favor. We need his favor. Are you kidding? Something we pray for daily, that his favor will surround us like a shield. And Psalms 119.58, with my whole heart I ask for your favor. We need the favor. We want to hear from him and we want to be used by him. And I ask every day, show me your salvation. But there is something maybe even greater that God's doing in all of us that's not as much talked about. He wants to work in us truth to sustain and uphold all that he wants to put upon us, in and through us. And everything the Father desires to do in you will require strong character and culture. Gifting and calling is irrevocable. Do you know that? His callings are irrevocable. And one of my favorite biblical understandings is what Paul wrote to Timothy and said, he called you, he saved you, and he called you with a holy calling. Oh my gosh, every one of you, you're not just saved, you're called. You are saved and called, and it's a holy calling. But that's potential. But character and culture manifest promise in our lives. You'll love this, this will be This is appropriate for the hour we live in. Romans 5, this is a beautiful portion, but it says this. And not only that, but we also, this is just a profound thought. We glory, we get happy, we rejoice in tribulation. what 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 a dichotomy, huh? I mean, isn't that just a perplexing thought? He said, glory in your What was your challenge this week? What was your heartache this week? Glory in that. Celebrate that. Talk about that. Show that on Instagram. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Glory in what you struggle with. Why? Because there's a purpose. Because God's always working inner and deeper. Glory. Because knowing. you got to know this. That your tribulation actually is working inside of you. Something that nothing else would do. Without that trial, you wouldn't have the education and the depth you have. If you didn't go through what you went through, you wouldn't allow the Spirit of God to do a depth inside of you for where he's taking you. What an amazing thought. Glory in your your trial because that tribulation is actually producing in you what money can't buy. A conference can't buy. Hold on. Let me get this out. A conference can't bite. I can't lay hands on you. This is the work of God inside of your life who lets you walk through trials and trouble to work inside of you something of eternal value. And let me say it like I feel it. Didn't didn't Paul write in Corinthians, this little momentary light affliction is working for me a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Praise the Lord. Look to your neighbor and say, this light affliction is doing something in me that's so much better. Because the things, oh, the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal, and God is eternal, working in the eternal, working in me. Hallelujah. Meaning, if you measure eternity with your problem, it's, but what it does for you is, Peter, (laughs) 
The apostle Peter, by the Spirit of God, says, this is almost comical to me. I mean, the Bible will make you laugh, won't it? In, in 1 Peter, he's talking about his love, and, and, and then he says this before he talks about the need of faith. If need be, you're tested. Well, I'm not needed. <laughs> Anyone got, I'm not needed, I don't need it, I don't need it. I'm not, I don't need it, I don't need that trial, I don't need it. If, ha ha, we all need it. If need be, you're now tried by these various, look to your neighbor and says, it's needed. But, but let me, I got to get to the text and finish this. Glory in your trial, because this tribulation is doing something for you that's so, so valuable, but, but nobody can see it. Ah, like, you can't, like, show it off. Like, you, you don't just show up with it like, something's happening, I don't know, but I, wow, I'm changing. I'm going from glory to, oh my gosh, I'm being transformed. I'm, I'm in my butterfly state. Oh my God, I'm becoming a butterfly. I'm going from a, a worm to a, I'm being, tra- but nobody can see it, but that's what God's doing inside of you. So take heart, be joyful, sing a song of praise, stay strong, anchor the faith, because God is doing a mighty work in you. And not only that, but glory, here it is. No, 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 just go back one more. I know, you're, I know, I want to get there too. I'm so sorry. <laughs> this is called ab lib. This is called, <laughs> and not only that, but look at, we glory in the tribulation knowing that the tribulation produces perseverance, and perseverance, and where's the place God wants us all to live? In hope. Do you know what lets us live in continual hope? This development of inward godly character. Deliverance. He wants. You don't want to have to do it. He wants. This is the mind to do because he's more after your character. I love him. What a perfect. Can I just tell you this? There's nothing he's done that you can ever blame him for. He is perfect and above reproach. My Bible says Psalms 1830. Ask for God. Your way is even the way you were born and the trial you walked through in God was perfect to let you become who he's called you to be and walk in the glory and grace he's given you. Isn't Psalms 51 verse 6 so telling? Isn't it so revealing? You desire truth in my inward hidden parts? It's his deep, listen, it's his deep, deep desire that truth, his truth, the spirit of truth, take root, take ground, and become anchored in your heart, soul, mind, and body, invading the space of your inner world, dwelling richly on the inside of you, touching, transforming all areas and aspects of your life. You desire truth in my inward. I know we want truth in our nation. We want truth in the education. We want truth, don't we? But maybe truth begins with me. So first, truth is an inside job, but then it works to manifest itself in every area of our life. And it will translate and materialize to everything in our life. On the job, in every sphere of life, what's in you will come out of you and will dictate. I love that thought in Philippians 2.13. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Where is he working? In me. Isn't that amazing? Working in you for his good pleasure. If truth, if the spirit of truth, if God's truth is not operating on the inside, it will not manifest to the outside. But if it is operating on the inside, it will always manifest to the outside. God really cares about your character. Because we all move in the kingdom at the pace of our character and culture. If you study Psalms 51, which is David's sincere prayer after 
Nathan the prophet came to him and revealed to him his sin with Bathsheba. But not only does he say, God, you desire truth in my inward parts. In verse 10 he says, oh God then, create in me a clean heart and renew within me a healthy, make me healthy, make me whole again. I've occurred some traumas. I've occurred some things. I don't have internal health. God, do a work in me. And then in verse 17, he even gets deeper, and he says, this, listen to this, the sacrifices of God is not just your song. And we're so blessed with so many people who serve this church. It's really a broken spirit and a contrite heart that he takes ownership of. He's touched, he's healed, broken to make whole. Like a shepherd, when a sheep runs, breaks the legs to keep that sheep from running. So he, ah, he breaks away the old. He breaks away the bad to make it, because he's a potter. And he, so he breaks away the old to make the new in us. Isn't that beautiful about God? Say it with me. Truth is an inside job. Which is why... Within our five weeks of studying on this, within the structure of the scriptural context, as the psalmist David says, I choose, I've chosen the way of truth, but the way he ends that moment is he says, God, I can't walk in your precepts, I can't walk in your commandments until you enlarge my heart. Meaning, I can't move forward in you unless you do something new inside of me. What, what talk is that? Don't you love that self examination that honesty, that brokenness? I love what Ivan said, God can only heal what you reveal. And sometimes we're so in such pretense with God, but let him in, say, God, I need you. I need this help. I need, I'm honest, I'm trans. I need you to do something in me so I can go to the next phase of my life because if I don't get there here, I'll never get there physically. I got to get there first internally. I got to get the breakthrough here. Something has to happen. My heart has to be expanded. We all need that continual work of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we need that. Pastors need that. Moms and dads need that. Elders need that. Because there's so much garbage and corruption that we intake that we need a continual work of truth on the inside, keeping us tender, keeping our hunger growing with the ability to expand and enlarge. When you look at that word in the Hebrew, it's amazing, but it actually means that by the unseen realm of the spirit, God works in you to create growth, to handle physical growth. It means, watch this, to delicately unseen make special arrangements when you sleep. Because when you're awake, you don't let them work. When he made, when he made Eve, what did he do to man? Put him. Sometimes God has to put you in a season of sleep to allow him to do the work in you to bring out of you what he wants to do inside of you. And it says that when I'm not aware or when I'm walking through dark seasons, alone seasons, you're doing the greatest work. When I'm going through the darkest moments, when I'm going through, when I can't see and when I don't know and I don't know where my, when I'm dark, you're doing the lightest work inside of me because you're doing a work in me to create growth of character to uphold the blessing you want to give to me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Do you remember when the fishermen caught no fish? Jesus said, put it on the other side. Their nets broke. What did they do? They called over their friends to catch it. A lot of us catch a fish. Here, here's, here's, here, here's, here's what I believe. God wants to break your nets, 
But until you're willing to bring over your friends to enjoy your catch, he won't break your nets. You know you have a touch from God when what he does for you, you include everybody else in it. But if what God does for you is just for you, you got to be enlarged. Because whatever God does through you should always include everything and everyone else. I got a catch here. Come on. Let me pray for you. Let me help you. I'm, not, I'm blessed to be a, but if you're still blessed to be blessed, you're not enlarged. You know you're enlarged when you say, oh my gosh, it's not my life, it's our life. And I want to I wanna love well, give well, freely I have received. Free. And so you know how your healthy is, is if you can bring over somebody else, even an enemy, say, come on, partake of this catch. But if you, no, 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 but if you can't do that in truth, you know I need God to enlarge me so I can go to higher ground. If you still play favorites, It means to expand the size open wide <laughs> as a result of removing barriers. Why? Because the Lord wants an established, firm, strong character in us, in me. He wants a lifestyle of truth that we live, not Sunday. But that your culture is so strong in God, you go in and change the culture of the things you're around. A culture of truth. You shouldn't be influenced by the things of this world. Not if you're strong on the inside. Doesn't Ephesians 6 say, be strong in the Lord and the power of his? Be, be strong in the, that's the inner man. That the, the, the truth of God, his word, his nature, his spirit, watch this, would become who we're becoming. We don't have much debt in God. In fact, he paid for the cross and the blood of Jesus, retired our eternal debt. A debt he did not owe. He paid our debt of sin. We have no doubt. But there is, there is a New Testament debt responsibility. You can't pay for your sins. You can't pay for your redemption. You can't buy your salvation. There's nothing you can do. By faith, you are saved through grace. It's a free gift of God. There's nothing you can do. But there is a responsibility, and there is one debt we have to pay. 1 John 2, 6 says this. You ought, it's your debt to pay, to walk as he walked. Meaning, I can't pay the debt of Calvary, but I am supposed to live a life mimicking the culture and character of my father on earth. He does want me Christ-like. I'm supposed to, it says, you ought to walk as he walked. Because the spirit of truth on the inside, the work of God on the inside, is translating to the steps and behavior of my life. Let me say this, it's always more about who we're becoming than who we are. Aren't you thankful? I love that about the Lord. We haven't arrived yet, no one in here is perfect, perfect in character, but it's who we're becoming. I've prayed this prayer for years, it's written on my Bible, I write different things on my Bible. I like to look at them and like checks and balances, like maps, you know. I got in my Bible, never neglect the ones I've given you. I got this prayer I got from a missionary, David Brainerd, uh, in 1741. Lord, let me make a difference for you that's utterly disproportionate to who I am. I want somebody one day, if you want to paint that and put that on my office, I love that prayer. I've got created me, but, but one prayer I have in here, would you pray it with me? I think it's up here. Let what's done in me be undeniable to others and irresistible to you. Would you, would you part, part, take and participate with that with me today? Lord, let what's done in me be undeniable to, whoa, you're a believer. I told you a couple, I told you after the revival night about my, the tailor right down the street here, a beautiful man. 
probably mid-50s, and actually my son Talon told me about him. I used to go across town and had a tailor there for 20 years and helped him and helped the pandemic, gave him Walmart cards, and just trying to be a blessing. He's from a different country, just sharing Jesus with him, and my son said he's a great tailor, and he's cheap down there, and I walked, and I think Talon said, I think he's a believer. So I walked in there, and same day service, next day service, he had Christian music on, and I just told him, hey, how, how you doing? I, I'm a pastor right up here, and thank you for your service and all that. And the last time I was in there during revival nights, I told you that he told me he's so busy, Sunday's when he catches up, he can't make it to church because he has to catch up. And I thought, well, gosh, what a great opportunity. We got Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, maybe we can invite him to something and do that. Well, I wasn't able to take that card in, and I felt so bad. So I just had recently done a wedding, and on my on my blazer, my buttons were coming a little bit undone. So I walked in there and I said, sir, would you just help fix this blazer? Remember, I'm the, I'm the pastor from up there. And I gave him the card and I said, I know you're busy. I'm just believing God can work out your schedule to come. So I was supposed to pick it up uh, the other day and I didn't get around until till Friday and I went to walk in there. And he said, my brother, my brother. And he brought me my suit and he said, it's my honor to serve you. It's free of charge. And I said, sir, no, no, I want to pay. I said, how can I help you? And he said, please pray for me. And I kid you not, I took his hand, and as I feel the Lord, I started praying, and the man begins just to weep. And I said, Lord, I want to be so tender like that man. I don't have, he's a Christian. It's so apparent. He wept. He's so humble. I want something in me that I don't, I'm a preacher. I want, I want my life. I want something inside of me to be so Christ-like. And then I left that place. I, mean, I took his hand. And he just wept. I'm like, this guy loves Jesus so much. I'm compelled. Don't you want to allow the spirit of God to use your life as a living epistle? That, that you're humble and you're pure in a world of chaos and a world of wickedness and a world wanting to get money. This man, don't you want to allow the spirit of truth to work inside of you that we're not ugly and mean, we're beautiful, we're kind, we're sensitive, we're considerate. And I left that place and got into my car and I said, Father, he spoke to me. I got a message today. I learned from that man. I want to be tender. I want to be soft. Say it one more time, Lord. Let what's done in me be undeniable to others and irresistible. He desires truth. First Peter one twenty three. It gives us wisdom and revelation about this: the Word of God. Just thankful for God's Word. Oh my goodness. The lamp unto our feet, the light unto our path, the road map. And it says this about the word, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but incorruptible. Through the word of God, which lives and abides. So we're actually born again from the seed of truth. The word of God is the seed of truth that holds the greatest transformative power on planet Earth. And when we get born again, God starts sowing the seed of truth into us to transform us. But you have to let it germinate. Because a lot of people have the potential of the incorruptible seed. But until you partner with it and live responsive to it and not isolate it, you don't get the full benefit of its transformation born again by the incorruptible seed of God, and that seed wants to germinate and become the greatest thing in you. Choke out the wrong, grow the right, the word of God inside of you, growing, maturing, the word of God inside of you, that true seed. But again, you cannot isolate truth inside, you have to engage with it. And you can have much true seed inside you, but until on the inner part you start participating with it, yielding to it, and obeying it, you'll never get the full benefit of the word of God in you. So a lot of us have areas of our life where the word's there, but because I haven't submitted to truth, walked in truth, obeyed truth, it's dormant. And I'm letting either soulish, fleshly, Things choke out the word. 
four soils, one was good. Because until this gets ripe and ready, the word won't produce God's fullness in our lives. So it's that true seed that transforms us. Do you know that just a little bit of God's word can change everything in your life? One revelation from God. Do you realize one, one, idea, one revelation from God, one scripture on your home, one declaration, one thing of obedience can transform every area of your life. So I just want to stress so much before we break down these two things. Whatever you do, don't isolate truth in your life. I'm a bit of a football fan and sports fan. Uh, one of the biggest trophies is the Heisman Trophy. It's a stiff arm. They're running back, running, and he's pushing away. Don't stiff arm God away. A lot of us are stiff arming help. We're stiff arming the word. We're don't stiff arm. Embrace it. Submit to it. And humble yourself in obedience to the word of truth, because every time you obey it, you give it ground. Every time you do it, you give it root. Every time you live in accordance with the word, now you're letting the word of God grow. Every time you don't obey, you're actually giving yourself over to a spirit of disobedience. So we have to partner with it. Live engaged with it. Again, how can a young man cleanse his way, live right? One way, by taking heed. Living in accordance with the word. I want, listen, I want my heart to beat in harmony with his and my life to be lived in harmony with his word. Do you see that? I want my heart to be in sync with God and I want my life to be lived in rhythm with him. That's God's plan. So here's the truth. Here's the gospel. The gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The best news, the greatest news, the best narrative ever said, friends. This is the truth. Galatians 2.20. I have, you have, been crucified with Christ. It's no longer you who live. You, the insecure you, the deceptive you, the wrong you, the false you, that's... You've been crucified with, you were on that cross. You're dead man, you're fallen man, you're sinful nature, you've been, come on church, we've been crucified with Christ and we've been completely transformed because Christ lives in me. And watch this, in the life I live, I now live in the flesh by faith in the Son of God. That's the truth. You gotta war with that, you gotta declare that, you gotta renew your mind to that. Every time anything contra, I have been crucified. My evil dictates, my everything, my past, it's all been, come on, it's all been at the cross, it was nailed. Everything, everything, my confusion, my hurt, my, I've been crucified and now I come out by the word of truth, a new creature in Christ because the word of God and truth. I think differently, I treat people differently, I have, I'm, not, I'm not narcissistic, I'm living a life by the spirit of God to... Because something of God transformed. That's a never-ending process. We will be walking out that until the day he returns. But that is the word of God. Say it again. I have come with faith today and assurance today. Make the enemy quiver, church. Come on, I have been crucified. I need your help today. I gotta take a break. I'm gonna get some water. I need you to carry this verse for 30 seconds. All of you, are you ready? I have been, come on. Come on, declare it. Now come on, give God a shout of praise. That's the word. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. That's this life, friends. Life in the spirit. Life in the word. It doesn't make us weird. It makes us right. It makes us normal. It makes us God. God not turning it upside down, but right side up. Turning you right side. The enemy turns you down. He's turning you right side up. This is how we live. 
This is how we walk on our campuses, in our school, in our social media, and all the secret places of your life. Truth is prevailing. Truth is working. Why? In John 17, Jesus said, Father, make them one as we are one. Oneness. The Father's desire for our lives is to make us one with truth and harmony. Jesus said, Father, you and I are one. Make them one as we are one. To live united with God. I'm looking at Patty and Robert here. About seven years ago, we filmed a little, the businessman had it on his heart to nearly pay for a year of advertisement at the movie theater. Wonderful. Ab and I stood there at that camera. We had all, probably an iPhone 7 at that time. I don't know. It's, it was ancient. Dark lights and everything. But we stood up there and welcomed everybody. We're da-da-da, welcome. And Robert and Patty were in that auditorium. I don't know what they were watching, but watching something. <laughs> and they came to, came to our church, and they've been here ever since. And they said, just last, last Sunday, last Sunday, and don't worry, I won't get too, too I'm going to be very generic, but it's true. It's just the truth. After last Sunday, Ab and I walk here, and they beehive up to us. I was thinking, security. <laughs> Kidding. <huh? laughs> I mean, boom. <laughs> I know it was a rough Sunday, but please have mercy. I'm crying out for mercy. Pastor, we walked in this church seven years ago, in debt, a mess, on the verge of complete divorce, over, over. Here is an offering to the church because we are now happily married, completely out of debt, totally restored. Hallelujah! Isn't that powerful? That's the word of the word. Hallelujah! It's the word. That's what, if you give them time, you got to give the Lord enough time. Hang in there. Rest in him. Wait on the Lord. Seek him. And he will transform every area of our lives. Praise God. First internally, then because we've all been crucified. Isn't it so cool? To know you don't have to live that way any longer. So everything about the Lord is he's wanting to bring our life in sync with him. Are you with me online? Stay with me. He wants to bring us to oneness. My speech, my thoughts. My, is in, you know what integrity is? Being one everywhere you go. To integrity with God. You're living one. The worst life is a departmentalized life. It's hard to keep up on lying, huh? Because it keeps growing and growing and growing. A life of truth. A life of oneness. Amen? Like, I'm not just married to Abby at home. I'm married to her everywhere I go. You're a Christian. You're walking. Everywhere you go, it's one life. That's the best life. In sync with the Holy Spirit. And it's very normal and natural. I'm just telling you in that you're carrying the character and the culture of God in everywhere that you go. And because of Jesus, all because of Jesus, and only because of Jesus, our triumphant king, his bloodshed, that crown of thorns, he who knew no sin that became sin, because of that, John says that we have received, watch this, the fullness of grace, grace for grace. There's nothing we don't have available. There's nothing he had. Grace for, I've told you, for you, you got grace for this, Mary. You got grace for you. Grace for grace. You got grace for it. There's the supply of grace for it. And through him came grace and truth. Let me just throw this in there for a moment, then I'm going to end today and just the next couple moments. And through Jesus came grace and truth. I believe the highest place a believer can live is in the place of truth. I do. Grace, 
in, 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 in a definition, is the divine empowerment of God. I've, this is deep, I've taught this for years. <laughs> Sorry if they, I, I've taught this. Grace is the divine empowerment for God to elevate me to live in truth. Where does God want me to live? So I have enough grace, the abiding presence and word of God to get me to a place of truth. It catapults me. I told you as a kid, I had a little bit of some isms, like we all do. And my cousin, they had a huge trampoline, and I was so weird about it. I thought I was going to roll an ankle. I couldn't jump very well, and I still have some problems with my balance. I mean, ah, these guys are just so balanced, amazing. I, I struggle. You know, it's hard. I'm not, I'm not very flexible. And I would remember, I just kind of like, ah, it's so fun, you know? Yeah, great. And they're popping flips. I'm like, ah, I mean, I don't want to be weird, but like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm serious. And then boom, boom. And I was just free. Then they would come to me and mess with me. And I would just begin to, and they would come and jump. And I would hit, and I would boom. That's what God does. He comes in, come on, with his power and his anointing. And you're just like, you're struggling. You're, you're on the verge of, you can't make it alone. But the spirit of God, grace, comes and boom. Breaks you through to new levels and new dimensions, and there's joy and there's peace, and and now you're like, woo! That's what the word does. That's what a good church does. That's what worship does. It takes our inability and empowers us to live in a place I can love one another. I can forgive. I can live free. I because grace takes me to a place truth. Why don't we have a trampoline, babe? I'm like, it would be so fun right now. In my mind, I think I could jump against a troop and I could do a flip or something. Do you know, I still can't dive. I, sh I can't even dive. Isn't that weird stuff? <laughs> I'm so freaked out like it's glass. I'm not going to. So I'm <laughs> That's why he called me. You know when God called you, you can't do anything else. <laughs> no, I'm going to say something. <laughs> Let me just... How do you know you're, I was asked this the other day, how do you know you're called to preach? For me, when you can't do anything else. I'm being honest. <laughs> it's called cruel and unusual punishment. No, I'm kidding. No, I'm, to, to preach at this level. And I say this, if you can go do something else, go do it. Because this thing... If God's called you to it, you can't do anything else unless fulfill God's heart. And he will, like Jonah, strip you, strip you, strip you until you surrender and go to Nineveh. Now, we good? I stimulate you? We ready? Because I'm going to break these two things down, then we're going to go home. Have a wonderful day. And you're never going to be the same. You're hungering for God. You're growing in the nature of God. Something's happening. Oh my gosh, I see on the inside of you. Wow, Dad, you're changed. Whoa, 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 whoa. Wow. Look at me. Something's happening on the inside of me. Something's changing. Something's turning inside of us. So, first and foremost, we identified culture. Culture that learned behavior, how you were raised, passed down from generations. Culture is like this is how we do it. Right? The culture of truth, there's one culture of truth. The culture is the vehicle by which character goes through. It's very clear. The culture of truth is faith. This culture God wants in all of us, in your mouth, in your homes, in your family, in your ministry. We have a culture of faith here. A firm, resilient, steadfast faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's who we are. That's our culture. By faith, through faith. In our text, was that not strong words? <laughs> the the, the, the spirit, spirit of God says whatever's not of faith is. You're not living in God's culture if you're not living by and through the language and the mindset of 
faith. I'm not talking foolishness. I'm not talking what God told me. I don't have to ever work again and do X, Y, and Z. And th- I'm not talking that. The Bible says if you don't work, you don't eat. If you can. I'm not saying foolishness. I'm talking a, a faith in the word, and a faith that faith and works, right? I mean, a faith in what Jesus done and accomplished at the cross. A faith. A resilient faith. What did Paul say? The life I now live, I live by? How are we going to approach Monday? As we navigate the nations of the world, and we all watch with eyes wide open at Ukraine, and what's going to happen, and oh my gosh, nuclear. Man, this is the manifestation of prophecy. I was telling my kids, one of the greatest things that prove the Bible is prophecy being fulfilled. It proves itself right here. God said it first. We're watching. Isn't that exciting? But how are we? By faith. By faith, by faith we're going to pray, by faith we're going to gather, by faith we're going to preach. We are a people, you are a household, we're not weak, we're courageous, we're strong, the righteous are bold as a lion, we are a people of faith. Come on, that's how we live guys, by faith. I'm going on to my job, by faith. I'm leading this family by faith. God knows I'm leading this church by faith. That's our culture. That's our language. You're justified only by faith. You're actually only made righteous by faith. You're only in right standing with God because your faith in Jesus. That's imputed. It is an imputed because of by faith. And then in Romans, I don't have time for it, but Romans 5 says that by faith you inherit all the grace of God. You actually enter into the fullness of grace by faith. Amen? Come on, say it. The just shall live by? Come on, we got to keep walking by faith, guys. Can't go by what we see. Can't go by what we hear. We got to judge it by. So sing a little louder. Amen? Pray a little more. Seek God a little more. Faith gives me access to everything God has accomplished in grace. That's Romans 5. Right underneath the character, it says that. Now, the culture of truth is faith. And here's where I want to end today. And it's 1135. We haven't been done in church in years this early. (laughs) You guys want two services? (laughs) The culture of truth is faith. But the character, the character of truth is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. What is, what is truth wanting to do inside of me? Create a character of truth, right? It's working inside of me to develop a nature, a character. What is the character of truth? Paul says, look at me, it's not eating and drinking. It's not where you live, it's not how you dress, it's not how high or tall, it's not who you know, which isn't our world right now all about the exterior things, isn't it? Isn't everything now about eating and drinking? Isn't that right? Can I, can I give you one funny joke? I thought all day about it, didn't know if I should use it. Well, I'm gonna use it. Can I give you one joke? You know, I don't, Ab and I don't ever wanna brag when we go to expensive things but we did just leave the gas station this morning. I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> we don't want to brag, but that triple digits did, did, did put a little bit of, <laughs> woo! You gotta live by faith. You know what was cool about that too? I walked into worship and I felt the Holy Spirit say, say that joke. And the whole time I'm like, no, 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 I'll mess it up. But he knows. <laughs> Come on, that's a good time to smile. Loosen up. Come on, it's who we're becoming. God's here. He's faithful. Come on, take, take a deep breath, man. It's not about, it's not about where you live and what you got. It's, it's just all a t- you know that when he comes and he is returning, if nothing else, when Jesus said, when these things happen, look up, look up, your redemptive trough, not, that should put a sense of expectation. We're, I'm ready to go home. We're leaving. This is not home. We are passing through. You are sojourners passing through. We are on an assignment. We'll soon go and hear the trumpet of the, of the sound. Woo! That will trumpet the sound of dead Christ will rise and we will meet him in the air. Hallelujah. It's coming soon. Behold, I am coming quickly. Behold, be ready. Occupy 
until I come. So it's not external. What you eat, how you look, friends you got. It's this internal work of righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I'll say right now the four governmental realms of God in the earth right now is His righteousness, the reality of His peace, His joy, and the person and power of the Holy Ghost. You, church, have everything you need right now working on the inside of you. But let me teach it. I got some time. I'm almost done. Wow. This righteousness is not imputed. Meaning, when we get saved because of Jesus, the Father makes you righteous because of Jesus. That is true. That is justification by faith in Jesus Christ and Him alone. As I said moments ago, you can't buy it. You can't pay for it. It is a gift of God will never be able to comprehend this great salvation. But this righteousness is different. This righteousness is actually meaning truth is manifesting into the right way of living. You're now looking like your father. Righteousness, seek ye first, seek ye first his kingdom and his, his way of his culture, his thinking. His rhythm, so that what's in you can be this righteous way of living. Jesus said, you've heard it said, but I say, when you get hit, give him your coat. It's a different way of living. It's a righteous way. It's the nature of God inside of me living out the nature of truth, righteousness. His way of living, his way of treating people. His way of treating people. It's God's character taking root in me. It's allowing the born again nature. What does the Bible say? The new man, the newness of life to come out of me. Put on the new man. Don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Don't gratify the lust of the flesh, but walk in the spirit. You will not fulfill. It's, it's this life of renewed. Read Romans 6. Oh my gosh, Romans 6 is powerful. Romans 6 just kind of eloquently says it like this. It says, don't, don't you know that you were buried with him in baptism? That just as Jesus was raised from the dead in the glory of the Father, so you should walk in a newness of life? A new way, it's, a new, it's called the way. I had all this in my message I took out, but in Acts, nine, like nine times they were called the followers of the way. They were a sect. They were follow, we are followers of the way. We're the way. We live a certain way. Everywhere we go, it's the way. It's one way, his way. We live a life of character. We live a life of purity. We're walking in the way of truth. And Romans 6 breaks it down for we have been united with him that our old man was crucified that the body of sin might be done away with. Now if you died with Christ you should also and a lot of us have died with him on salvation but have not lived with him. Big difference. Living with him. Communion with him. Now, if you die with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ has been raised from the dead and dies no more. Death no longer has dominion over you, for death has died, and you died to sin, and he died to sin. Verse 11, likewise reckon yourselves as dead to sin and alive. Say that, I'm dead to sin, and I'm alive. That's electric right there. That right there, is that not? And if you got to say that a thousand times, I'm dead to sin. I'm dead to that fear. I'm dead. I'm alive to God. Righteousness inside of me. The life, oh, it's the, the best life is the righteous life. The best life is the way God's called it to. And then righteousness takes you into this realm of peace. 
One of the most beautiful things we have as people is we have peace because God is peace. All throughout the word, he is peace. And we can live in continual peace. Peace. That's life in the spirit. Guarding my mind and guarding my heart. And the God of all peace, Jesus spoke peace. He declared peace. He looked out and saw storms and he spoke peace. Yesterday, I was so touched, I was tickled. Sometimes God winks at you. You ever, just sometimes, like, my son Talon and I are going on Wednesdays and we work on writing stuff and he, 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 has a, he pulled out his laptop and he pulled out this little, like, cleaner and he's wiping down his computer and I'm like, gosh, I like that thing. And I like my stuff clean and organized. And I'm like, I wonder where he got that. I wonder where he got that. I'm just thinking to myself. And on Thursday, I go up to my office and, um, <laughs> uh, I have different compartments in my bag. Let me just tell you this story. I'm almost done. I don't want to be done, but I'm almost done for your sake. And all the time I'm like, hey, babe, you know, I try to explain it to her. Like, I don't know, it's this thing. And I, I needed to get something like a pen or a highlighter or something in my front pocket, and I pulled it out, and I pulled out this little gray, exact, the same thing he had smaller. And I pulled it out, and I was like, oh my, that was like the biggest deal. Let me just say this to you. Sometimes God just winks at you in the smallest ways that I see you, I love you. That light changed my day. I'm like, oh my gosh. Don't forget when God winks at you. There's a lot of big things I'm praying about that haven't been answered, but sometimes that's enough for me. It's peace. And if he can get that in my bag, then he can walk me through every problem I'm walking through. Peace. And I want you just to know he sees you. He knows you. He is the God of peace. And he is with you, guarding your mind and guarding your heart and with everything through prayer and supplication. Let the peace of God, the peace of God, the peace, I got the peace. It's the presence of God. Peace is the fruit of his presence. So yesterday, as is my custom, I went to pray and I headed out on Winchester. And I looked over to my left and I saw sheep. And I just was so touched, like, wow, of course the biblical significance is everywhere. I went and prayed and had a time with him and I pulled over and just sat there. Like, Lord, talk to me, teach me. Sometimes I do all the talking in our relationship. <laughs> you do too? <laughs> right? And there was this young sheep herder, shepherd. And he had a black, beautiful black dog, probably a collie. Hundreds of sheep. I kid, this, is, this is the absolute truth. And I just sat there trying to get a picture. And I was about to call my kids because I can't do it. Figure it out. And portrait mode. I just forget it. <laughs> forget it. I'm going to, okay, Lord, I'm going to enjoy the moment, you know. I'm going to be present. And I saw the most beautiful thing. First, I was enamored with all the sheep, how they were grazing, how they had such peace, how they were sovereignly in a place to eat. God knows where to bring you, what church to put you in, how we qu just, just, I, this is, this is the Lord is my witness. The shepherd is on his phone and he goes to the right, hundreds of sheep, and the shepherd does this. He lays down. His dog lays down, and he sat this as long as I sat. He just sat like this. Let me tell you, our shepherd is seated at the right hand of the Father. There is nothing to worry about, be concerned about. He's fought every battle. Every word is true. When there was a storm, he was at the bottom of the boat. He spoke peace. Let me tell you right now, enjoy the peace of Shalom. Enjoy the peace of your shepherd. Whatever you're facing, whatever you're going through, there is peace. There is rest. This is not the end. He works all things out for good. And I just sat there and go, I need a pastor like that. You know how I pastor? <laughs> day to day, man. Day to day. Come on, don't you? You know how you raise your kids? Oh, my gosh. I mean, I took on something of that. I, mean, I was like, last night I couldn't hear from my son for an hour. So I'm like, what's going on? We worry, so concerned. He owns a thaddle on a cow, thaddle on a cow, a cat on a thousand hills. He's got more ways to bless you than you can imagine. 
There's not one hair of your head that will fall without him knowing. He is the perfect shepherd, and he gives us this most away. Peace. Peace in our bodies. Peace in our minds. Peace in our minds. We have peace. Oh, I need that. Oh, I can work on that. Righteousness. But you know what it really means? Because I've got to be scripturally correct because some of you will, you won't know it, but here's the truth though. You know what it really means at its core? Is peace without conflict and fighting others. Meaning you don't have to live in conflict with others. You know what he's really saying? Stop fighting. Stop bickering. What he's really saying is Psalms 34, 14. Leave evil and pursue peace. Do you know that you can't have peace until you leave evil, until you leave the fight? He's saying sheep have peace. Have peace. Oh, we could talk all day about this peace. The third thing is joy. Joy is the joy of salvation. We're saved. We know him. We're forgiven. We're accepted. This continual state of joy that you know him. It doesn't matter what's going in in my world. I know Jesus. Joy. We're loved, accepted, forgiven. When the disciples came to him after a great crusade, they're like, Jesus, oh my gosh, demons trembled and we cast out demons from people. And they were just like, this is the pinnacle. And Jesus, as he does, rebukes them. He says, you're wrong. You're rejoicing for the wrong things. You should rejoice that your name's in my book. You know why? Joy shouldn't be schizophrenic on what's happening. It should be, it doesn't matter I have the joy of the Lord that is my strength because I'm His, because He's called me, because He's with me. Therefore, I have joy in every moment that my name is written. So mature joy isn't on what happened today because I lost my joy last week. And I'm having to learn these lessons over because it doesn't matter what's happening externally What's happening eternally is everything that matters. So I say joy over your life. An unexplainable, supernatural joy that cannot be quenched. A joy of the river of God, the peace of God, the presence of God. And one more thing before we go. There is a river. Jesus is a river. And there is a river that flows. But the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 12 verse 3 that with joy, with joy... With joy, you'll draw from the wells of, think about that. You got a bucket? Your bucket's joy. And every time you, with joy, you tap into God's reservoir. Joy is how you tap into what's behind you. So if you feel like like salvation's getting dead and boring, joy, rejoice. Because joy taps in, man. Joy unlocks the supply of the river of living with joy. With joy will things sing, see things restored. With joy will th- see things come alive. With joy. All that takes place in and by the presence of the Holy Spirit. Church, the character that God desires in your life is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's not by might, it's not by power, it's by His Spirit. Would you stand up on your feet today and lift your hands all over the room? Amen. Amen. Come on, say it. Say, I got, I've got righteousness. I got peace. I got joy in the Holy Spirit. 
Come on, all over the room, we lift our hands high. Sheep have peace. Mm. Sheep have peace. Sheep have peace. Sheep have joy. Father, I'm asking today after this word. Father, I've studied your word. I endeavored to preach your word. Truth is an inside job. I know this is a word in season for me, for all of us. We can't go by the things we see. I pray now that the culture of faith would arise. The culture of faith. Believing. Trusting. Thank you for your embrace. And I pray, Lord, that the character of truth for the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. I feel today, honestly, the enemy has stolen some things. The Bible says in Ephesians, let he who steals steal no longer. And I believe today, I've fought for this word. The Lord is bringing a word in season. And today, there's going to be a restoration on righteousness, joy, and peace. If you need a touch from the Spirit of God, something, something from heaven, something of God, not of this earth, something of the Lord to come in the area of righteousness, peace. I'm talking about anxiety, sleepless nights, disorders, any disturbance. I'm here today. I believe because this is what I feel. Romans 16, 20. And the God of peace will crush Satan. Today, the God of peace is here to crush Satan. To crush. Quickly, get out of your chair and come to the altar. Quickly, quickly. There's a manifestation. I'm coming for peace. I'm coming for joy. I'm coming. I'm here to receive. Come on, team. Help me, guys. Here, help me here. Help me here. Can we get this? There's a restoration. Joy of peace, of righteousness. Get my joy back. David lost the joy of his salvation. Just to know him. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, get close, get close. Get close. Come on. Father, we thank you. Father, we praise you. Come on, let's lift our hands high to heaven up here in a sign of surrender. You got something? Come on. Hallelujah. Come on, church, believe with me. comes in if things aren't healed properly and steals the things entrusted to us. So today, by the authority of the Word of God and the name of Jesus, I am asking King Jesus, the God of all peace, to crush, to crush depression, to crush fear, to crush loneliness, to crush anxiety, to crush hurt and pain. Jesus, I'm asking you now Bring the manifestation of your kingdom, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. We say, be restored. Be restored. Come alive. Restore to us the joy of our salvation. Give us our praise back. Restore our song, our tenderness of heart, our innocence. Father, I pray in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, awaken inside of them. Restore, 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 impart. We declare the peace, the shalom, the joy, rejoice, righteousness. He makes it right.
Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Jesus' name. We say be restored. Jesus' name. I want to pause. I feel there's people in this room, you really are dealing with anxiety, mental battles, panic attacks. And I want to wait just for a moment because he's here at this altar to alter things. And there's a restoration today. Nothing to be embarrassed about. Nothing to, nothing to be embarrassed. Everyone up here, we all need him. But I want to wait just for a moment. You need something restored. You need something restored. Thank you, Jesus. Say, Father, today, I thank you for restoring righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. By faith, I take and receive what's rightly mine. In Jesus' name. Is that you? Can we pray for you? There's nothing to be embarrassed about. Did something I say, is that what you're walking through? God knows. In the name. Romans 16, verse 20. Jesus, the God of peace, is crushing every lie, every inherited, every disorder. He's rearranging your DNA. You're being saved and made new. Lift your hand to heaven, sweetheart, and say, Jesus, I surrender all. Come here. And come here, babe, in Jesus' name. In the name, wow, wow. Every torment. you here hey, look at me you too you know why he brought you here because the pastor here the soil here not the, because there's something in this environment you don't even know but in the atmosphere things are getting healed restored your heart's coming alive again because your heart got hard and i understand it man because time happens and things happen but today god is awakening your heart again He's stirring your heart again. He's giving you a new heart. There was a heart of stone, but now he's giving you a heart of flesh. So stay in this atmosphere. Stay under this anointing, because soon and very soon, truth and only truth will be your zip code and will be your address. In Jesus' name. Come here. Get the hands on you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Now, before we leave this altar today, I want you to know by faith, say by faith, we've received, we have the righteousness, the peace, and the joy of the Holy Spirit. We're not going back there the same. Today we came, we heard the word, and we have received by faith everything we need to walk it out today. Now you guard it, you keep it, and you protect it. Amen? Put your hands together. Thank God for that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Woo! Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. He reigns, he reigns. Now before we leave today, I know we're a little scattered now and wiping tears off and we've had church. We've had church, look around, we've had church today. But well, we don't wanna leave real quick online or in, if you have not surrendered your life to Jesus. No greater miracle than accepting the Lord Jesus Christ as your savior. If you're not right with Jesus, wherever you are, would you lift up your hand just to as a sign of surrender. Is that it? Lift your hand up high so we can see it. Praise God. Let's just say it and seal it. Say, Jesus, you're the way, the truth, and the life. I give you my whole heart. Thank you for your blood and for your salvation. I'm saved. 
I'm a child of God. In Jesus' name. Hey, before you go today, say hello to somebody. Enjoy the coffee shop, hang out. And let's walk in the fullness of this. Amen. We love you. Praise the Lord.